Welcome to Pittsburgh, a place that's reinventing the world of energy through innovation in production, distribution, and conservation. Hi, my name's Bill Flanagan, host of Our Region's Business here on WPXI-TV. And it's my pleasure to give you a quick overview of what was, is, and will be when it comes to energy. We're going to cover more than 150 years in a little less than 10 minutes. So get ready, it's going to be a fast ride. Our story begins way back in 1760, just two years after Pittsburgh got its name. Miners began digging into the side of Coal Hill. We call it Mount Washington today. Turned out the hill was full of one of the richest coal seams in the world, the Pittsburgh Coal Seam. Just happened to be right across the shallow Monongahela River from the early settlement of Pittsburgh itself. Well, thanks to energy from coal and transportation provided by Pittsburgh's three rivers, industry took hold here. And over the next century, Pittsburgh grew into one of the world's great industrial centers. The growth was so extraordinary here and across North America and Europe that it created an energy crisis. You see, back in the 1850s, people depended on oil to keep the lights on, whale oil for oil lamps. The demand was so huge that whalers had pretty much killed off all the whales in the North and South Atlantic Oceans. They were beginning to sail into the Pacific in search of more. And there was growing concern that the world was at peak whale. Well, if no alternative was found, the lights could go out. Western civilization might even come to an end. As is often the case, however, when there is a big problem to solve, some bright young entrepreneur comes up with a solution. Here in Pittsburgh, it turned out to be a fellow named Samuel Keir. He was from Indiana County, about 50 miles east of Pittsburgh. His family owned a number of businesses, including a canal boat company. Remember, this was in the days before the railroad had made it across the Alleghenies. Well, in operating his canal boat, Sam couldn't help but notice the useless black slick that came bubbling up out of the ground around here. Fouled wells, occasionally it caught fire. It was called petroleum. Well, since he knew it burned, Sam got to thinking that maybe he could distill something useful out of it, an alternative to whale oil. Of course, folks here knew a lot about distilling from well before the days of the Whiskey Rebellion. Southwestern Pennsylvania was the center of moonshine making. So Sam set up his distilling operation, what's recognized today as the world's first oil refinery, at the corner of 7th and Grant in downtown Pittsburgh, where the U.S. Steel Tower stands today. And sure enough, he was able to tease an alternative to whale oil out of the petroleum. We know it today as kerosene. But once the world understood that there was a commercial alternative to whale oil, the next challenge was to get more of it to the surface. Another bright young entrepreneur came up with an idea to do just that. His name was Colonel Edwin Drake. Actually, he wasn't a colonel. His backers gave him the title to impress the powers that be in Pittsburgh. Well, Drake had a notion that he could borrow salt well drilling technology from nearby Ohio and use it to drill for oil. Back in those days, people drilled for salt brine as a food preservative. It was, after all, before there was any such thing as refrigeration. So Drake hauled drilling gear to Oil Creek, about 80 miles or so north of Pittsburgh. And in 1859, he struck oil, the first commercial oil well in history. And now with plenty of oil and a way to refine it into a useful product, there was a true alternative to whale oil. And that's how Pittsburgh saved the whales. Yeah! Before long, oil derricks replaced the forests on hillsides throughout western Pennsylvania, and oil refineries sprang up from Pittsburgh to Cleveland. The world's first pipelines were built here to get the oil to market. But all that industry created a new problem, the pesky gas that came up out of the ground with the oil. It was useless and dangerous. Every now and then an oil well would blow up. Drillers flared it off to get rid of it. Pennsylvania's hillsides burned 24-7. Once again, a bright young entrepreneur from Pittsburgh saw this as an opportunity. His name was George Westinghouse. He'd come to Pittsburgh from upstate New York right after the Civil War with an idea for a better way to stop trains. It was called the air brake. In fact, most of the trains in the world still use the technology to stop themselves today. Well, Westinghouse was building a successful air brake company in Pittsburgh when he got interested in the natural gas problem. He figured out that if he could find a way to tame it, it might be possible to heat and light businesses and homes. So Westinghouse drilled test wells on his estate in Homewood, about eight miles east of downtown Pittsburgh. He tinkered and invented most of the technologies used to manage the distribution of natural gas from the wellhead to the gas chandeliers in wealthy Pittsburghers' homes. He even started the Equitable Gas Company, now EQT, that's still based here. It's become the largest gas exploration company in Appalachia. Fueled by coal, oil, and gas, Pittsburgh grew into one of the largest industrial centers in the world. 
producing steel for the railroads that stretched out across the continent and for the skyscrapers reaching to the sky back east. But in the fast industrializing world, oil lamps and even gas lighting weren't sufficient to power machines and light the cities. Innovators began to look to electricity as an alternative. Well, no, Pittsburgh can't claim for its own the invention of the first reliable electric light bulb. Thomas Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park, certainly deserves that glory. But Pittsburgh can lay claim to the technology that got all those bulbs burning, alternating current. You see, Edison was a believer in DC, or direct current. It was a low voltage system that required lots of generating stations closer to the end user. An associate of Edison had a different idea. Nikola Tesla firmly believed that AC, or alternating current, was the better way to go. High voltage AC could transmit electricity from central power stations over long distances spread across a widespread grid. But for all his genius, Tesla couldn't convince Edison. Instead, he sought out George Westinghouse. It's fair to wonder why. I mean, after all, Westinghouse was a railroad inventor who was dabbling in natural gas. Why in the world would he care to challenge Tom Edison? Well, if you think about it, Westinghouse had made a fortune managing pressure, whether it was the air pressure along the length of a train that made his air brake work, or stepping up and stepping down the pressure of natural gas coming out of the ground to distribute it to customers in nearby cities. Well, alternating current posed a similar problem. If you think of voltage as the pressure of electrons in a wire, then the challenge is stepping up and stepping down the voltage from long distance transmission to a lower voltage suitable for lighting businesses and houses. Tesla and the Westinghouse engineers in East Pittsburgh set out to develop all the technologies needed to do this. Generators, circuit breakers and transformers, even electric meters. Eventually, they went to war with Edison over the idea. It was called the Current Wars. While Edison fought to convince the public that AC was unsafe, Westinghouse got the contract to light the 1893 World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition, held in Chicago. And once Westinghouse and Tesla had proved that AC could be safe and effective, they went on to light the modern world. And they did more than light it. Westinghouse made electrical appliances, created the first commercial radio station here in Pittsburgh, and even built the world's first industrial atom smasher just east of the city. See, it was back around the turn of the 20th century that Westinghouse and Lord Kelvin of Great Britain got together, and they mused about whether it might be possible to create electricity from nuclear energy. But all of that had to wait until after the Second World War. During the war, Pittsburgh steel mills produced more steel than Germany and Japan combined. But the region paid an enormous price for all that industrial production. It was pollution. Street lights burned 24-7 in a place that had been described as hell with a lid taken off. As it turned out, the war itself had made it possible for Pittsburgh to eventually clean itself up. You see, the Manhattan Project that led to the atomic bomb also galvanized research into nuclear propulsion for submarines. Westinghouse got the contract to build the power plant for the Nautilus, the first sub to cruise under the ice all the way to the North Pole. Once they'd achieved that goal, the company insisted that commercial nuclear energy could substitute for coal and help get the soot out of Pittsburgh skies. So in 1957, the world's first atomic power plant built solely for peacetime use went online at Shippingport in Beaver County. And Westinghouse went on to develop the technology that powers half the world's nuclear reactors today. Submarines of a different kind also helped to clean Pittsburgh's air, German U-boats. Back during the war, convoys of ships hauled fuel oil from Texas and Oklahoma across the Gulf of Mexico, around the tip of Florida, and then up the Atlantic coast to the big shipbuilding centers in New England. At least they did if they could get there. German U-boats kept sinking them. So to maintain production, the government built oil pipelines from the Gulf Coast to New England. Pipelines just happened to pass near Pittsburgh. And once the war was over and the pipelines were no longer needed, they were converted to natural gas to supply the Northeast. And Pittsburgh was able to substitute natural gas for coal to power industries and heat homes. It's the reason that even today, Pittsburghers more than most Americans use natural gas for home heating. And that should have been the end of the story. With Pennsylvania's gas and oil fields largely tapped out and with the entire world humming on alternating current, Pittsburgh's role energizing the world was coming to an end. But wait, there's more. Another bright young man became the father of the Marcella Shale. Way back in 2004, Bill Zagorski got to thinking there might be gas in the Marcellus and Utica shale formations that surrounded Pittsburgh about a mile and a half down. He was a petroleum engineer for Range Resources, and Range agreed to give it a try. And they struck gas, lots and lots of gas. So much gas that the Marcellus and Utica now represent the largest natural gas reserve in the Western Hemisphere, the second or third largest in the world. 
And as it turned out, the gas under Pittsburgh wasn't just useful for heating things. It's full of natural gas liquids that plastics companies use as a feedstock to make things. Well, today, 150 years after it all began, the world is again making its way to Pittsburgh, exploring upstream for gas, investing in midstream facilities to move gas to market, and building factories downstream to use the energy for both fuel and feedstock. Shell Pennsylvania Chemicals is constructing a $6 billion petrochemical facility in Beaver County, about 30 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. And the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania says there could be as many as four more so-called ethane crackers in the Ohio River Valley a tri-state region that includes parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. The investment is expected to attract other downstream manufacturers over time. Sam Keir and Colonel Drake would have a hard time recognizing the energy-related innovation happening in and around Pittsburgh today. More than a billion dollars of energy-related research flows through the National Energy Technology Laboratory every year. Universities and corporations are researching everything from better combustion technologies to microgrids. And manufacturers across the region are making parts for windmills and solar power plants, all the while developing new materials for the region's growing green building industry. Yes, Pittsburgh pioneered intelligent building design in the United States with the opening of the David L. Lawrence Convention Center early in the 21st century. Then the largest, still the only platinum LEED certified convention center in the world. And organizations as diverse as PNC Financial Services and Phipps Conservatory are operating on the cutting edge of building technology, reducing energy consumption, improving performance, and even developing living buildings that operate completely off the grid. Today, more than 250 years after it all began, Pittsburgh is a global leader in developing new ways to produce, distribute, and conserve energy. Quite a journey from the days of Coal Hill, Kears Refinery, and Drake's Well. And with that, this fast and furious tour of Pittsburgh's energy history is, as they say, a wrap.